I am going to begin by introducing our panelists. I'd like to read their full bio because all of it's important. So um, we're going to begin with Carter. Uh, Carter is Chief Sustainability Officer and Executive Director of Climate Action at SUNY. Uh, the State University of New York spans 64 campuses, including three teaching hospitals, and it educates 1.3 million students. With over 30 years of experience across government, nonprofit, and private sectors, Carter has been a leader on developing strategic vision and implementing tangible solutions to environmental issues, and is a recognized subject matter expert in water, air, energy, national, natural climate solution, climate risk assessment, and green business development with a proven track record of driving organizational change, creating partnerships and policies, and building infrastructure. Is the mic too hot? Is this better? I don't know. Next, we have Raya, aka Climate, Climate Auntie. Raya is the founder and executive director of the Energy Justice Law and Policy Center. She is also the convener of the Energy Justice Alliance, a grassroots bipoc like coalition based in New Rochelle that's advocating for a just, community led energy transition. She's also an adjunct professor at Cardozo Law School and is widely published in matters of energy regulation, including Energy Justice, her 2018 book. Raya serves as a member of the New York State Climate Action Council, which I'm excited to talk about. And then finally, we have Dave Mankari. He is an accomplished HR professional, holds an MBA from Syracuse University, a BS from Marist College, and is SHRM SCP certified. He currently serves as VP of Human Resources at Brightport Energy, overseeing talent acquisition, employee relations, talent engagement, performance management, learning and development, and DEI programs. Under his guidance, Bright for Energy was certified as a great place to work and named an INC Best Workplace in 2023. So, hooray for our analysts. Oh, so, uh, I assume you're all here because you're interested in jobs and what it takes to get into jobs. Um, and maybe you work on getting people into jobs, but I'm going to focus on the people who are like, I would like a job and I wanna know what it takes to get into one. So first I want to ask anybody who wants to take it, what kind of trends you're seeing in these industries. So when we're talking, let me let me back up. So when we're talking about clean energy communities, you heard, or, uh, clean energy careers, you heard this earlier, we're talking about things like renewable energy. So you know, solar, wind, geothermal, so energy from like the heat that's in the earth, energy from, you know, waves, it could be any of that. That's all clean energy. But we're also talking about saving energy because the energy you don't use is the cleanest energy at all. You don't have to generate it with anything. So that's energy efficiency. That's things like insulating houses and buildings so that they use less energy. That that kind of work. So any of those industries, and we've got different kinds of experience in those different sectors and different expertises, but I want to pitch it to whoever wants to take it. Um, what kind of trends are you seeing in these industries um, and this might, you know, first go to Dave, um, and this could be things like we can't hire people fast enough or policies that are driving growth, you know, like, oh, we had federal or state, you know, movement, that's meaning that there's more, we need more people or, you know, shims towards, you know, work in the field versus work in the office, any of those kinds of things. Um, just like, what are some off the cuffs? What are some trends? Sure. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having us to Samuel Westchester. And uh, everyone that's in the room today, really excited to be here. A lot of the different trends we're seeing is the shift in policy from the federal and state incentives and tax, tax rebate programs. So they're driving the investments for our communities, but also our corporations take advantage of the tax incentives and the rebates that are accustomed to them. In addition to that, what we're also seeing are a lot of local laws within cities, states, municipalities, primarily here in the Northeast, but also trends into the Midwest, they also into the Mid-Atlantic states. So that's the macro view of so as to where we are today with the passing of the Inflation Reduction Act, the RRA, and also some state incentive programs that New York State specifically has for the growth of the clean tech jobs in with the New York State. From an employer side, we have seen a tremendous amount of applicant flow into our organization from individuals from a lot of different backgrounds, right? This macro industry as clean energy is fairly new. It's not mature in a lot of areas. 
three different verticals we operate are lighting, so LED lighting, as simple as a room like this. We'll look at the controls in here. And like Cal said, right, energy efficiencies in these rooms. Moving from plain fluorescent light bulbs to LED, as simple as it sounds, you'd be surprised the amount of energy that is wasted in New York, specifically New York City, in a lot of the buildings. So we work a lot with New York City schools, New York City precincts, to actually retrofit their entire building um, from fluorescent to LED light bulbs. Solar will also work with a lot of commercial clients on putting solar canopies in their parking lots. A lot of you probably have seen that community solar where your houses might have some type of community solar component to it. Also rooftop canopies for, um, for a lot of the buildings as well. And the last is geothermal technologies, which we're specifically in the commercial market, but we've just finished a project actually up at our college, which is up in Dutchess County. We have a project starting this summer at Yale University for geothermal technologies, and we finished the largest multifamily residential building for geothermal technologies this past uh, fall into the winter with 324 holes. So that's 320 different holes that were drilled uh, for one auto street, which is the largest multifamily resident building uh, for geothermal technologies in New York State at the time. So there's a tremendous amount of excitement, energy around this industry. There's a tremendous amount of experience that we look for. But it's a lot of technology that can be transferable from different trades. If you worked in construction, if you work an engineer, an architect, or even just entry level positions. And I see a lot of faces I talked to at the job fair today. And a lot of it is the aptitude to learn, bringing your skill base and understanding of how to be collaborative, how to communicate with a team, and how to be how to be a part of something larger than yourself. So. In the market, we see a lot of trends based on those macro trends I, I spoke about earlier. Um, but it's an exciting time to be in the industry, and it really is putting yourself out there. And maybe I have some transferable skills, maybe not everything, but let me work with an employer who's also going to provide me with the proper training and learning opportunities to get accustomed to these new roles that we're seeing as we continue um, within the next couple of decades. Thank you. That was very helpful. Um, Glad to comment on this trend question. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. I really don't like being between people and their dinner and their, you know, happy hour cocktails, but glad to be talking about this. Thanks for bearing with us. Um, there are just two to his point. It is a just an explosive time in terms of investment and in, you know, clean energy, including workforce. Um, just to touch on some of the trends, you mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act um, on the federal level between the Inflation Reduction Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, um, and even some of the still the COVID money, there's unprecedented billions and billions of dollars that is going into this um, sector from the, from the corporate side, but also looking to you know uh, invest directly into workforce development. The same is true on the state level. We've got new investments coming. We've got things like uh, the Environmental Bond Act. We're going to be seeing a cap and trade program happening in New York State called Cap and Invest. That regulation is rolling forward. That's going to create new pots of money. So we've got you know, money crisis in, in, in really kind of in, in investment. I, I like to say you know, we can have an abundance mindset in a way in how we approach approach these things. Uh, the New York State Climate Action Council scoping plan, you know, pointed to a lot of these opportunities and it talked about the really explosive, you know, job growth that some of these types of investments can create. I think the top sector they were thinking was buildings, you know, energy efficiency, I think followed by solar, but also offshore wind, you know, the whole, the whole gamut. So there's a real trend in just sort of, of, of growth in the industry. And the second piece is this um, idea of quote unquote disadvantaged communities or priority communities where in New York state and there's also some matching federal policy that really 40% or a good amount of these benefits, the benefits of these investments must accrue to quote unquote disadvantaged communities, which are quite often, basically it's the most um, climate vulnerable and pollution burden communities. And they have been identified on the state and federal level by zip code um, by some of the state federal processes. And I mentioned that as a trend because I think you kind of alluded to some of this. It's like from the macro view, folks want to see that stuff happen, but there's still a lot of question marks, I think, in a lot of folks' mind in terms of, well, what does benefit to a disadvantaged community mean when you're talking about 
a transmission line, and we've got the folks from NIPA here, you know, a transmission line, what does it need, you know, in the context of a wind farm, like how do we define this and how do we connect the, um, you know, the, the good intent to actually having local hire in our MWBEs and seeing these opportunities actually reach um, folks on the ground. So um, enough said for now, and I'll pass it to Mike. Thank you. I'll, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think as, as you've heard, we're just getting up to scale. And to give you a sense of, of where we've been, there's been a few decades now of planning. I think I worked for, in New York City when Plan YC was just coming into the fore around 2007. Some of these issues were just being serviced. As you've heard, federal funding is now there. Oh, we're just getting started. And you wouldn't even think, I guess one thing to leave you with is, we're just getting started. Too late, no. This thing is just starting. The higher ed sector where I work now, I guess I can add two things to the conversation. One, the higher ed sector is very much responding to the needs of industry and, and green workforce development. So you can train yourself up. And it's important because, you know, I think um, we started something called the Offshore Wind uh, Training Institute uh, a few years ago. There's been some pickups that you've heard in the offshore wind training, uh, offshore wind industry. Um, so though the jobs are not there, but those tr skills are very transferable. And the things that are prominent right now will be things like um, every building system. Um, you know, it's like not, uh, that technology is happening. You may have heard, you know, city has some local logs um, that are driving uh, efficiency at the, at the building level. Just to give you a sense of the scale, so the conditions of providing the educational and training, so we big landlord, we have 90 million square feet, we're the biggest state agency, and you know, across 64 campuses, and um, we have clean energy decarbonization plans that were just done. So they're, you know, months old. And the clean energy program that we're going to have, just as one rather big, but one, you know, landlord, you should call it, look at us that way, is probably in the tens of billions of dollars that we're going to be spending. And we're going to be spending it largely on geothermal heat pump systems. And that means digging those boreholes. That means transmission line, you know, the, Redoing our, our heat distribution systems, revamping all the distribution within buildings, not to mention all the energy efficiency work. So that's a lot. And building renewable energy where we can, and then building energy storage to make a, our, our campuses more resilient. So that's just on the energy side. Uh, you know, my role, which is rather new, and again, sort of demonstrates the commitments that organizations are, are making, also looks at clean waste. So if energy is not your thing, we're going to be doing a lot with um, composting, anaerobic digestion, food scraps, um, even surplus food donation, hopefully. I mean, we'll go down the scale. On the, on the environment, on the uh, transportation front, um, electrifying all of our fleets, that's happening. That's a brand new skill set. And we're very aware that we have to keep training folks on the internal combustion engines, which are going to be around for a while. At the same time, we're training people to work on electric vehicles. And then so it's, it's a lot to keep in, in your head, but it's the same analogous to what's happening in the energy front. We're building fewer, maybe no gas pipelines in the state, but we need to build pipelines for thermal energy networks. And so we have those. We're just starting that process right now. So there's a it's an exciting time in the industry, and I hope you all are are ready to start your breaks. Thanks, everybody. I want to get sort of a survey of of your thoughts. Um, I'm going to do a couple more targeted questions to get us sort of our brains moving on what the possibilities are. So, um, Dave, I'm going to send it to you. What qualities do you look for in candidates that want to work at Brightcore? Like, would you say that? you're interested in particular qualities and people who are interested in work and does it matter what kind of work they want to do or is like certain kinds of like curiosity and like problem solving is it is it standard is it pretty different sort of so that people can think about oh I, i'm interested in that or i have that quality yeah i think there's a couple of things here that we look for and then where you really want to work but especially in this new and upcoming industry like my fellow panelists said, it's not a mature industry, right? So a lot of it is there's tremendous growth opportunities and there's also tremendous funding that this industry has. 
but a lot of it is entrepreneurial bootstrap grit, right? It's not working at corporations that have been established for 25, 50, 100 years, Fortune 500 organizations, even some small cap organizations as well. A lot of these organizations are starting to look at skill-based assessments of our team and really think, what are some transferable skills when you come in? So for example, what we look for is somebody who can communicate effectively, whether that's with clients, such as Sumi, right, or a Fortune 500 organization, communicate effectively on the ground, as simple as a laborer or a tool pusher or driller who can speak to the client. You can collaborate together as a team, right? But I also think integrity is super critical to what we're doing and having that entrepreneurial mindset to say, this is still being built, still being developed, and you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? And I think those are a lot of skills we look for in saying, okay, you have some great knowledge, you have a great sense of urgency, it seems like, good work ethic. Now let's put great minds together and lead with our intellectual capital. But by no means does that mean anyone shut out. It just means coming with an open mind and thinking, hey, how can I build something bigger than myself, which is different than sometimes getting into a larger organization or even middle-sized organization where this is my job, this is what I do, I work you know, nine to five and I move this paper from the left side to the right side and that's it. This is very, I have to figure out what the paper is, where the paper needs to go, how the paper is going to be done type of thing. So those are just some of the things we look for. Can we, or do you want to go? Anyone wants to add? Can you okay, go? I'll add to that a little bit just in terms of flexibility. I will say because it is a new industry, I think um, we certainly are looking, you know, when we hire the right course in the world or other folks um, or, or, you know, look at their um, employees for that flexibility and, and, and because there's not, there's not really a, an established playbook um, for a lot of this. And so what has to inform the creativity um, uh, of, a, of a new approach to things, it, it really is a, being steeped in sustainability culture. So I think one thing to think about is understanding you know, why we're doing this, even a basic understanding of climate change, the processes, why what you're doing installing a solar panel makes a big difference in a small way, but it all aggregates up. I'll give you an example. And so we, um, at University of Buffalo, we built a five megawatt solar field. It's great. One thing I like about it is that um, in that design process, they made it very accessible to the public. And that's really critical because one of the things that's going to limit the solar industry is that, um, you know, we're going to have, largely in the Midwest or upstate, we're going to have build tens of thousands of acres at a time of solar field. And if you fence the whole thing, it's not going to, it's going to disrupt wildlife. It's going to, you know, there's going to be some problems and that's going to stop us. Well, what we did at Buffalo and it just came up from the sort of the design team as we were working through this is that, well, what do you really need to protect? You know, the panels, you're going to have goats under them. You can have, you know, people lounging in and setting, picking tables up. What you really just need to protect are the, the, the high voltage transformers. And so we made it very small. And I think that's scalable and replicable. And, you know, it seems kind of obvious as I say in a kind of simplistic way now, but I'm not aware of other installations that are like that. And so again, it's kind of the, each one is a little bit from I say, but it sounds like they're like, wait a minute, you're listening to like, is it the wild, wild west? And I think there's a part of that where the answer is a little bit yes. And that's something from the from a policy standpoint, we also have to remember that just because it's a clean job doesn't mean it's going to be a quality job, doesn't mean it's going to be a union job, um, and it doesn't mean that we're going to have um, access to these jobs to you know to all our communities, to our MWBEs, and so I, we need to be intentional in sort of creating, you know, making sure we're creating good jobs and good institutions. Um, and I want to encourage folks to be entrepreneurial because you can work for you know somebody who's already doing it, but you can be that person who, you know, does it sound a little bit like there's a ton of federal money floating around out there and folks have gotten together and pulled some ideas together. I think that's a yes too. And I want to encourage folks if that's, you know, if you're about that timing, be on that timing because you can be an entrepreneur too. And it's up to policy folks like myself and everybody's 
here to make sure that those opportunities are transparent and that we all, you know, our communities get access to them. Thank you. Yeah, um, I have a background as a solar installer, and we used to call that the solar coaster. As every few years, the laws might change, and suddenly everyone's scrambling to get their tax rebate before the end of the year, and you've got to work 80 hours a week, but during the summer, you get to take time off. So it was just always, you always had to be like very agile. The whole business has to be agile. Every person working there has to be agile. You can't be, you know, you can't be sit back on your laurels. So that's true for a lot of these industries, especially the newer ones. Solar is more established in New York State at this point, but I would, you know, I was installing what, like 2012 or something. So it was a while ago. But um, that's something to be something to be aware of. Something to be aware of. So uh, let's let's talk. Um, can Raya, can I prompt you? How can law and policy shape industry in a direction of greater equity? So like, what's the role of advocacy in in shaping this workforce development? And uh, what do jobs in in that sector look like? Like, if you wanted to do something more like what you are doing. So a little of both, <laughs> if you want. But I did like, <laughs> well, you're doing a lot. No one's to try to do everything you are doing. It went on to the other day. Sorry, I got a lot to say policy, policy. Okay, so policy has, you know, has a, a huge impact. Um, um, just just your example alone, you know, you know, what are the subsidies that are powering this? Um, and how can um, equity be a big part of it? So first of all, yes, we need to be intentional, you know, about the policy policies we make. And I think we have to be more ambitious and creative than some of the things we've seen so far. Um, just the fact that, you know, so we have this law that says, you know, 40% of New York State's climate spending must benefit quote unquote disadvantaged communities. I'm here to tell you, if you think that there's, you know, some pie in the sky person, Governor Hochul, one of her deputies, who sort of knows what that is and means, there's somebody up in a C-suite who knows exactly what that means, they, they mind you, they don't. <laughs> but literally, we're figuring this stuff out now as, it, you know, what will this mean? And that's another reason why I truly believe, like, we have to be in this conversation um, because it, we have to figure these things out in, in like, the docs because... That's one of the things that's the most frustrating is that, you know, uh, folks looking for jobs, right? Wanting to, eat, you know, passionately wanting to work in this sector. And, you know, hearing that there's so much money, there's so many jobs, there's so many opportunities. And it's just like, how do I, you know, how do I access this? Why is this so challenging? And I think that, um, and this is where the, the advocacy piece comes in because we pass these laws and then we have to implement them and we have to keep the pressure up be it, you know, to make sure that there are, you know, labor standards, um, as New Yorkers for Clean Power, I think you, you know about some of that advocacy. What are the labor standards? How are we going to make sure our NWBEs get access to this? What are we doing for the youth? What are we doing for our schools? That's where the advocates have to keep pushing, keep pushing to make it more transparent, more substantive, more creative, more actually doing things that change everybody's lives. So, um, and yeah, there's always, there's always, this, there's never been a more robust term to be in climate advocacy. Um, it's satisfying, may or may not pay well, sometimes it does, <laughs> but getting involved is, it, there's never been a more robust time to do that. I love talking about that. And I'll say, just starting on educating yourself, um, even uh, there's uh, the Green Jobs Network, the Green Jobs Board, I think it's what it's called. It's just one particular, I'm sure you know of it, one particular like job board, thousands and thousands of listings, just like starting to follow these different accounts, looking at what's out there, joining up with some crews, getting involved. It's really a way to. But yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I will say if you're interested in more of an advocacy side role, one of the best ways to get into that is to just start. I think up to the mailing list of various nonprofit organizations whose work you like. When they're doing action days, go to the action days, meet people, say hello, learn about the policies that they're trying to work on, you know, find out what's going on and make yourself useful. And frequently they will say, How can we keep you? Actually, and we'll make a job if you want. Do you want to well, well on that to 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 your point about that, like I had I had moved to Hawaii and done some things and come back to New York State and like when was that? Like twenty seventeen or something. And 2018, and I kind of was like, what are folks doing with this Green New Deal and all this advocacy? And 
you know, this crew called New Yorker News was trying to pass a private law in 2019. And I said, well, let me go be their legal observer when they're trying to do a die-in at the governor's office. It's a good die-in or private funeral. It's always a good thing to do. You know, you need, you know, you're going to get arrested. You need legal observers. I went to that protest. We got that climate law. They were like, hey, come work for New Yorker News and be an advocate with us. Like, that's literally what happened. I'll just put in a plug. I know we have a former mayor here. And, uh, you know, I, I cut my teeth. Um, in law, but then after law in um, local government. And it's so, it's such a great place to start because you can get it on the responsibility. And as, as Dave said, it might not be across the country, but um, certainly in the Northeast, almost every village, but certainly every city, county, uh, you know, it's going to have uh, some climate policy work happening and you can get involved. That's a great point. And a lot of those municipal jobs, they're like desperate for young people. <laughs> they are desperate for younger people. Like their 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 offices are graying and they're like, you show up looking for a job and they're like, please step in. We don't know how to use TikTok. So you know how to use TikTok. But I don't, I'm sorry, I'm slightly older than that, but you know how to use TikTok. You can get a job in government. So you're very nervous. Um, so, so oh, just one thing, uh, MWBE, the acronym, uh, is, uh, it just means a business that's owned by a woman or a person of color, they speak in, um, in case you heard that video. Um, and I want to pitch it to you, sure. talking about, uh, we're zooming, but not, not so much the SUNY plan per se, but what sorts of paths are available for someone more interested in like a planning, perhaps government nonprofit role something more like what you're doing or have done as opposed to like direct participation in industry at like constructing these projects. Yeah. Um, where to start? I mean, the planning side kind of followed directly from mm -hmm. policy. So maybe that's the next step after policy, probably the swipes of the way. Um, and, and there's so much that needs to happen. As I mentioned, there's, um, you know, our, our clean energy master plans are really plans. And so I think if you're looking at like discipline, for example, law is not bad. It's, you know, it's kind of a, uh, can be a jack of all trades type thing, lead to a lot of places, but, but urban linen degrees and, you know, uh, things of that nature are really important. I think a, a basic understanding, certainly of economics, um, yeah, is, is really critical um, because despite this flood of money, which we think is important, it is, um, you know, it is important to make projects pencil out and uh, you know as you as you add everything together so the, you know there's a there's a lot that has to happen I think I, the key thing about planning I guess is that it continues that engagement of the larger community that hopefully has happened at the advocacy level and through legislation and then when you're talking about actual projects I mean think about the difficulty I mentioned this you know citing a big solar project that there's going to be neighbors don't want it, they just are. <laughs> and there's going to be some people who benefit and you've got to sort of mediate between, um, you know, all these concerns while keeping your eye on the prize of the, of the big project transmission lines. I mean, I think the big thing in the future is getting people to understand that they share an interest in this clean energy, green transition overall. Um, even if it means a change in the status quo, which is curious to a lot of people. So I think the planning discipline, if you will, or process is one where they, they kind of mediate between that. Thank you. Um, all right, Dave, can you talk to us about entry-level positions at Braycorp, like specifically at Braycorp, what are some of the sort of entry-level jobs um, that someone might start, and what kind of education is necessary for the di the different like startup so, jobs? Yes, yeah, certainly. I think general base level is a high school diploma, GED, for any one of our roles in the organization. A lot of our roles, entry level, if we look at our lighting vertical, for example, it could be a lighting specialist or auditor. That's a simple had to put that to the fore, but that's as simple as coming into Pace University, buildings like this, doing a full audit on an iPad, being able to go through a checklist, understanding what type of lighting infrastructure is currently installed, what is the client looking to do, what's the feasibility of actually doing something like that, and as simple as checking switches, so lighting control audits. So when you go 
out of out of here? Did the lights turn off automatically? Is there timers? Is there non timers? There's a lot of local laws in New York City that actually beginning to require this uh, when lights can go off. As simple as that sounds. So a lot of entry level, good paying jobs, and also get to start learning additional uh, additional field. In addition to that, uh, a lot of analysts on our team kind of start off with some type of experience out in the field, but just in general propensity to learn. And it could be in business development, it could be finance, it could be in marketing, it could be in solar, all these different types of things. If you bring the right attitude and the propensity to learn and so a good skill set, we will provide training tools and resources. And that's kind of going to your point too of looking at communities in which we serve and where are where are where's our team members coming from, right? Each and every day. And how do we ensure that we are out in the market and finding the right talent for the right need at the right time. And then on our geothermal vertical as well, a lot of this comes down to it's not a mature market. So a lot of individuals are not going to be trained or come with a background of understanding necessarily geothermal technologies. A lot of our drillers come from fracking or gas, oil and gas. And a lot of them relocate into New York State or actually work in Pennsylvania, perhaps, with fracking and come into New York State and transition to renewable energy. I wouldn't say that's necessarily an entry-level job, but when, we, when you go further down and you look at a tool pusher or a laborer, somebody who understands some type of construction background, maybe has a couple months or a year of experience in construction or even no experience, but has a good, strong work ethic, we will train them. We will bring them up to speed. We talk about apprenticeship programs as well. That's through the Department of Labor and, and our partners um, that we're putting in place there. But those are all, you don't need to come with a whole full bucket of things. If you have the right opportunity in front of you and you have the right attitude and the ability to learn and break some skill set, these are really great paying jobs in New York State, at least in our organization. Great name, like what? Uh, well, in New York City, transparency law, you can check any of our jobs and you got to think, hey, I'll be there one sec. But for example, a tool pusher, so somebody who's helping a driller, right, who comes in, great paying job, you're looking at something around eighty to $95,000 a year. And that's obviously a non exempt hourly role that is um, open to overtime as well. So you could potentially have six figures working on our drilling capacity depending on the projects and where we go working that is good money i will say just like one one thing in, in, the, in the building trains for example you know operating our buildings we talked about construction but then there's the operating side um you think about something that might have been like a custodial role. It's now involving building management systems and some at least familiarity with 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 um, controls. Um, I'm not going to be programming per se, but you know an ability to um, understand uh, you know remote controls. And you're you're looking at a sophisticated room, sophisticated building, and they're all going to be like this in the future. And it's not going to be flipping a switch. It's going to be working with sensors. Um, you know, I think about this, um, in an earlier role, I worked in the wastewater industry, water wastewater, top old school in a way the needs were all around controls and instrumentation. So those are really critical skills. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, yeah. thinking about that idea of people transitioning out of fossil fuel jobs into clean energy. Um, let's talk about just transition. So we heard a little bit about that at the earlier panel. Not everyone said it everything. So when we talk about a just transition, you know, we're talking about how do we do this thing of going from the energy we're using now to a cleaner energy system in a way that doesn't leave people behind and that doesn't, you know, screw people over based on where they're located or the kind of people they are. Um, and so I want to put this one to you, Raya, because you worked on the Climate Act, you worked on the uh, Climate Advisory Council, if I've got that right. So what would you say is the role of workforce development in a just transition? So this is a very, very important question. And I think you, you did a great job of describing just transition. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll just add a few more layers to it in that I think 
it's fair to say originally it did start out as very much like a labor concept in terms of like, you know, folks who do jobs in X, you know, if we're transitioning to Y, we need to make sure that those same people don't get left behind and get jobs in Y. And then, you know, as, you know, climate advocacy and movements moves forward, there came this sort of idea of, you know, what is a just transition in terms of moving from extractive economies to different types of economies that also talk about what are the like deeper transformations that we need to make to get at the at the root causes of the climate crisis. Um, and I, I mentioned that because certainly in New York State, this idea of climate justice, um, be it the 40% justice 40, that idea of like investing in communities that have been um, historically dis disinvested in that have been um, excluded because of racism, because of redlining, you know, all of these practices um, to the, you know, the pieces in the law about air monitoring that are looking at, you know, what communities are burdened with bad air. So, so it also can include like this, you know, just mentioning this like broader trajectory of like, how do we change the, um, the sort of the trajectory of energy systems in terms of their, uh, you know, a legacy of harm to a legacy of cleaning up our communities and also providing a lot of those economic opportunities. So um, that's just to, to speak to it a little broadly, kind of theoretically about um, just transition uh, and workforce development is everything to that. And I really, I hope everybody like heard what these folks were saying. Like, they were like, what are the skills you need? What are you bringing to this? And they were like, bring your GED and a work ethic and an ability to learn, <laughs> you know, and, and I think that's, that's important. While I still think we need to do a much better job of making like transparent, like career paths and having it be that straight from the, you know, from the school to the university, right to jobs. And, and I believe we can get there. Um, so I just, I just want to encourage folks just, it may not happen overnight. You know, there may be it, you know, you get proximate to some of these industries, you speak to somebody like this, you may get a job the first round, maybe you, you won't, but, but stay in the game, be thinking about it, get proximate to it, don't give up, be entrepreneurial, because there are, these are the things, right, we don't hear about them, like some folks don't hear about, but now you did, he just told you there's an $85,000 a year job pushing some tools, I don't mean it, that was the name of the job, right? No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> So well, a lot of the times we don't hear about that. Every one of you just heard about that, right? So you need, we need to hear about these things so you know where you can fit in. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I'm gonna give you the next question and then I think you wanna be able to get your train. So Carter's gonna leave us a little early and then I'm gonna grill the other two. So, so um, can you talk a little bit about, um, as far as SUNY's energy transition plans, like? what kind of labor will that entail and over what timeline? Because that's going to employ a lot of people. So just like, what's that look like? And if you want, we can talk about whether other institutions in the state are going to need to follow suit since you're sort of leading on this. But mostly just what what's the project labor going to look like and over what timeline? Yeah, I mean, so as I mentioned, we just finished our the planning stage. So now we're hopefully, as I, you know, work to get some money for us from the Bond Act and federal money, um, we will start, and one of the things that we have in federal legislature right now is right over purchase, any purchase. So we'll see in this year's budget, maybe as early as tonight. I don't know, um, whether we have you know forty million dollars to start a thermal layers network there, thermal energy loop, which could ultimately it's it, it's phase one of the project with Con Ed. So who's going to be doing that project? Um, you know, it's going to be a lot of steam pipe fitters. We work very closely with that union. Um, you know, they're going to be welding those pipes and, and digging the trenches and, you know, ripping things out of buildings. Um, probably be, you know, construction trades as well. Uh, you know, retrofitting buildings to get used to that. Um, you know, one area connected to that, but also in some of our other projects, we're going to be HVAC technicians. You know, we there's a huge shortage of electricians. We can't hire enough and HVAC technicians. And, you know, those trades are doing very well right now. And I don't know, maybe Dave knows the numbers. I don't know the salaries, but I think they're pretty good. And so I think, it's, yeah, right, you know. <laughs> and so I think that's not, we haven't even talked about, but we talked about renewable energy. We're not talking about solar. We're not talking about wind. We're talking about um, buildings. So I think that that is going to be um, 
you know, those are some examples of, of what we'll need them. When, when the building's up and running, as I mentioned, we'll need folks who are, are operating it. I will say there's a lot of attention being paid also just to, I, beyond energy um, to, to the waste side. You know, our waste systems, we're not going to be able to landfill things anymore. So there's a whole big general field around materials management from designing, you know, fabric that doesn't shed microplastics into our oceans and ultimately into the fish we eat, which is scary, right? And so, you know, from designing that to, um, you know, smart collection and business systems, you know, there's, we're working with a, a, a whole industry now that didn't exist really five years ago in providing um, reusable um, food containers that are food service. It didn't exist. And now there's a bunch of companies that are doing that kind of thing. And it's, it's a competitive market, which is good to us. Um, there's going to be a, you know, post consumer food, collecting it, either composting, putting it in anaerobic digestion, doing something smart um, with, with our surplus food. So, that is something, you know, that's a whole other deal that has nothing to do directly with energy, um, but it but it's out there. Cool. Are we thinking we got some thoughts about challenges? I hope. Um, I took a couple of notes and they are from different things. But one of them is that in these industries, training often isn't standardized, right? So you're hearing them say, just come in with a good attitude and a GED, know which end of the hammer to swing, right? Um, and part of that is because, you know, if you go to a training program, it might be that they give you a set of skills that are different from what, like one company might want those and a different company might want different skills. And so that's a problem for the industry to solve. Um, and so if you know that a particular training program has a good success rate with placing people in jobs in the industry you're interested in, then go for it. But if you're like, I want to work at that company, so I'm going to get the skills that they need, but you don't make sure that the skills at that particular training facility are the exact skills that this employer wants, you may be out your time and money for no job. So look into that because it's it's not standardized yet. The industry is moving towards standardization, but we're not there yet. Um, that, that point about electricians, yeah. Uh, so electrify everything is a cute slogan until you realize we don't have enough electricians to electrify it. So um, you heard from our, our panelist earlier who's in the IBEW, uh, number, you know, uh, third Third, I can't remember. We should call that all of a sudden. Um, but he was talking about, you know, they're they're bringing in people as fast as they find jobs, and I almost wonder, like, what's the disconnect? Because there's always there are always people looking for electricians who can't find them, and these contractors are hurting for electricians. So you, you don't need, you know, specifically clean energy training for that. You could just go become a regular electrician, and a lot of places will pay for your night school. You know, that's what I did. Uh, as a solar installer, they needed more solar electricians. There was no there was no labor pool, and so they started an apprenticeship program. I worked at a company that turned out to be cool, but um, they had their own apprenticeship program where they were like sending their installers after work to night classes, and they were paying for the night classes you had to you had to pass, but they would pay for your apprenticeship. So not everybody does that, but there are places that that do things like that. Um, so on the job training is really important in these industries, and being an electrician is. A very cool job. Um, I also want to just say we're talking a lot about like the more installer types of positions, and I know that doesn't appeal to everybody. Um, I actually want to transition to us talking about that kind of in particular. So um, the building trades data for you. The building trades employ over five hundred thousand New Yorkers. Cool fact: uh, ninety-one percent of those workers are men. That's the census data. So. We have a problem, right? Like, oh, we can't find enough people to fill all of these clean energy jobs. Like, well, we are only pulling from half the population is the first problem. Um, and there are, you know, that's one demographic example. Um, and so on other axes, we're also seeing disparities in who's getting the jobs and who's not getting the jobs. So that's something really important to be thinking about. Uh, and it, on the one hand, you know, we need to be encouraging making workplaces more um like more more diverse workplaces places that it doesn't suck to work if you're not a white guy um and on the other hand uh we need to be talking about jobs that aren't specifically just these jobs that make you suck if you're not a white guy so um let's be thinking about what are some of those other roles there are things like you know you can be an accountant anywhere you can be an accountant at a solar company you know you can be you, everybody needs somebody to do the books everybody needs lawyers 
You know, everybody needs somebody to help with permitting. Everybody needs somebody answering the phones. You know, all of those jobs, some of those are entry level. If you started a solar company answering the phones, you might get into design, right? You might be able to get your engineering degree later and you can be made as the designs for the systems for the parking canopies with the solar panels on them, right? I keep using solar examples just because it's what I know the best. But um, so keep that in mind as you're hearing about this. We're not only talking about those specific jobs where you'd be like, have a wrench in your hand. Those are awesome. I would love to talk about making those jobs better for one thing. But like, if that's not your thing, if you're not up for banging your head against that particular wall, I totally respect it. And I mean, you know, lots of stuff you can do that is that. Um, as far as, so I want to talk a little bit about like, do you see anything moving the needle on bringing more kinds of people into these workplaces, whether that's women in the field as opposed to the office, whether it's people of color in leadership roles, whether that's hiring folks with disabilities or justice involvement, any of those kinds of things, new Americans that are in any of those kinds of things. Does anyone have thoughts on that that we could talk about? All right. I'll just, you start us off. I'll, I'll, I mean, I, I really think, and you know, thank you so much that our family is shooting up for. Good have only day for the reason they're running for hiker me. Um, I, I'm an advocate. I just, I believe in people power. I think that when you get progressive policy, that's one of the big things that moves the needle. And I, it's not the only thing, but you know, New York had the scrappy crew that passed this law, about 40% of the benefits going to disadvantaged communities. And next thing you know, it's federal policy too. And now it is the letter of the law in New York that when they have these guys' money, as you very well know, you know, they have to literally figure out how they're going to make sure that it can benefit different types of groups. So I do think that engagement is something that one of the things that loops nail. Yeah, I would say from the employer side, it's looking at all different aspects of the candidate and the diversity of the candidate, right? And where are we targeting or where are we going to? A lot of organizations just go to colleges and universities, right? But how do you go to technical schools? How do you go to community job fairs? How do you get into the community? How do you have a, a great referral program too of other great candidates from your current employee base as well? But I think you have to first understand where you are as an organization, where you wanna be, how are you reflecting the communities in which you serve, right? We work primarily here in the Northeast. A lot of our work's done in New York City area, but also Westchester County here as well. And our headquarters is over at Arbonne. And a lot of it just comes down to understanding what it means to us and what's our import, what's important to us and our values of our organization. We want to ensure that we have a workforce that has different experience, has different educational levels, has different upbringings, has a different representation, because that makes us better as an organization. The collective thought of we're all the same person coming from the same background, that's not going to really help us or have a competitive advantage for our organization. So it really comes down to building a high trust work environment, one that everyone's voices are heard each and every day. And I think if you make an inclusive work environment, other people will tell their friends and their colleagues to say, hey, I want to work there too. Hey, we lean forward. But then recommendations and saying, hey, where can we go to disadvantaged communities? Where can we go to community job fairs? How do we work with also state agencies as well to say, you know, we second chance programs and things like that are really important to look at the skill sets. And a lot of the two internally for organizations, you know, including ours, is the awareness and the training for leadership. When we're looking at candidates and we're saying, I have a good representation and that's part of our job in HR to bring that forward, but also for the leaders to be willing and having their eyes open to that as well. I think that I wanted to add to your point, like, like some of it is like, you know, it's just like, oh, you know, folks are looking to get like the highest paid job and just stick with it. We want a good job. But I also understand really importantly, a lot of folks are wanting to be a part of the clean energy transformation. Like you want to be doing good as, as part of their work or being involved in something like you know, getting away from that trajectory of harm in addition to having a family sustaining job. And, and to your point, you know, so and we can do, we, you know, all communities, we can do more than, you know, be somebody, not that there's anything wrong with having the right to be on the roof, but we can be in a C-suite too. And really any area that where you have an interest, be it entrepreneurship, 
accounting. This morning, I was at Columbia Journalism School talking about, you know, being a climate journalist. You know, they're, you know, an attorney. You know, there there are ways for everyone to be proximate to this field. I'm interested. Get busy. <laughs> so, I'm not doing a lot of things. Okay. So we are coming up on time. I've got a couple more questions. Um, let's talk about, so your job is in HR. So we've been talking about the job you hire for, but your job itself, how different is it to do something like HR for a solar or a clean energy firm as compared to other industries? Sure. Um, so I started with Brightcore about a year ago. My experience, um, I've never worked in renewable energy. I never worked in energy. I started my career uh, for uh, Target. I'm sure you own the Target. I did HR for them for several years. I moved on to Monitor, Monitor Health System. I'm sure you're familiar with that in the Bronx. Moved into a logistics company as well after Monitor. Um, so retail, healthcare, and logistics supply chain. And now I'm in renewable energy. And so it's really about transferable skills, right? It's all replicable, if I could talk, speak tonight, um, no matter what organization you work in. And I would say share that with all of you too. It doesn't matter where you come from in your industry necessarily. It really comes with an open mind and I can adapt and learn a new industry, right? This For HR, it's, the structure is very similar, no matter where you might work and kind of what you need to do to establish a HR program, but it also just comes down to the people at the end of the day. And for all of you looking for a business opportunity in clean energy, you got to put yourself out there. You got to look and you have to be very deliberate and you have to be specific as to what am I looking for and how am I going to do it? How am I going to get that? Right? So you may say, when you leave here today, you say, well, where do I start? Where do I go? Right? What is your attention? What are you looking for? What are you seeking? Well, I have these skills. I like these types of things. Okay. What type of roles are out there? And we have the internet. So there's a lot of great searches you can do. Say, what type of roles match that as to what my skills and what I'm looking for? Okay. What type of companies then should I be targeting and looking for and applying to jobs, not just waste of time? But you have to put yourself out there, get yourself organized, come up with a plan, and really be thoughtful around. Are there certain companies, uh, to Kel's point, certain companies I want to go work for? Or are there just general, do I want to be out in the community and come to job fairs and things like that? So my story in clean energy is about a year old. Um, it's, it's a great opportunity, great field to be in. Um, and the other piece I'll add to is your network is really important as to people you have worked with, other organizations that you have um, impacted as well and creating a good network of people um, to be your advocate as well if, if positions come up. Jeez. I personally mean that everyone here is like, I'm looking for a job, but we had that kind of tone, so I'll keep it a little bit. Because to your point, like getting a job and that whole thing is kind of a skill set of our own. Right. You know, it's like it's its own thing. And so and don't be afraid to ask for help about that. And it's, it's it can be a challenging process. Like, he, he, he was the Washington Post, there was an article just today that was like, HR is not your friend. But it's not funny, but it was funny because it was about how, you know, HR yeah. But it was about how folks were, you know, there's a company called like Cage Bird or something where where folks are sort of reaching out to sort of like build the skills to like how to advocate for themselves within their own jobs, you know, situations, how to look for jobs. That's an important thing too. It, it can be very discouraging and frustrating, but it's it's another skill set. That's definitely the case. Um, I can tell you, uh, I like I was doing um, like seasonal environmental work. So I, I was like a summer uh, education docent for the Nature Conservancy up in the town I lived in in Maine. When I was in college, you know, I did uh, white roofs coding in New York City for a while. I did a bunch of like seasonal jobs. And then every fall, you get laid off and you have no job. And then in the spring, you have to find a new job. And that sucks. So I was like, what will I do instead? And I decided I would be a solar installer because it was 2000. 11 it was free jobs free jobs the green jobs were a lie at that point but i did get trained as a solar installer during that brief window of optimism before we actually got funding um and the way i got a job was i uh looked up every solar installer or electrician that did solar in a three-state radius this is in new england because my family's from new england and i 
cold called all of them and I sent every one of them my resume. I got three callbacks and one of them hired me. So sometimes you've just got to go for it. Um, that's not necessarily the best way to get a job, but it did work once. So, <laughs> um, so Riot, did you start out wanting to be climate work or was that a pivot for you? And then I'll, I'll wrap us up after that, but I'm curious. I, I was, it's, you know, we got to get home, we got to get, home, we gotta get these cocktails. It's raining where we are. No, absolutely a pivot. I was a second career lawyer. I didn't go to law school till I was in my 30s. You know, I did a bunch of different stuff, entertainment, youth work. Um, and then, you know, became a lawyer, learned about energy, energy regulation, energy transactions, and then moved into advocacy from there. So truly, this idea that it's never too late, and it's, you know, you can always sort of make these pivots, I think this is, is a good one. All right. We're going to wrap with any final advice to people who are interested in getting into the industry. Any last advice to job seekers? Both of you can answer this. I would just say be resilient and adaptable. Understand that, to our points earlier, it's not mature. There's a lot to be learned, but you could be a part of the greater picture, be a part of something larger than yourself, which I think is really exciting in this industry. I, I love how how you get, and I kept hearing that advice again, advice again and again. I'm sort of like, have built some sort of a little bit of knowledge and background about what what this industry is. So you can come in and you can say, like, you know, you know, this is why we're doing it. People don't have this figured out yet, you know, but I'm here to show up adaptable. Like, I love that stuff. Um, and just, I want to encourage folks. I know it can be so discouraging. I've, I've definitely been there many times myself. Um, and, you know, just don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Sometimes something happens overnight. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it takes a while. But don't be discouraged because the connections are there. And and also, I'll say, to your point, you talked about the training programs. Be very careful about those. We really, as advocates, we need to push. Just because it's a clean job doesn't mean that it's a good job. And we see all over the country a lot of abuse, you know, happening to to workers, you know, based on these training programs. Not good here, it's good here. So be very, very careful with that. I think it's all excellent advice. Um, do I have any advice for you before we wrap? Um, uh, sure. So, no, you know what? Let's just be done. Thank you all for your time. Thank you for our panel.